1944, as World War II was drawing to an end, representatives from 44 nations met at a hotel in Bretton Woods, New Hampshire, to hammer out a new financial system for the global economy. Out of Bretton Woods came the World Bank, the IMF, and most importantly, a new role for the US dollar as the international reserve currency. At the time, the United States controlled most of the world's gold, and they agreed to fix the value of the dollar to gold at $35 an ounce. Other countries then fixed their exchange rates to the dollar, making it the central cog in the system. In 1971, in response to increasing inflation and high unemployment, Richard Nixon suspended the convertibility of the dollar into gold. The fixed exchange rate system became a floating exchange rate system, and the Bretton Woods Agreement was dead. But to this day, the dollar still remains the international reserve currency. This special role has long irritated other countries. In the 1960s, the French finance minister coined a term to sum up the contempt. The dollar, he said, had an exorbitant privilege. Zhang Yanling, a former executive from the Bank of China, argued in a speech last week that the Western sanctions on Russia and the weaponization of finance that we've seen would cause the US to lose its credibility and undermine the dollar's hegemony in the long run. She suggested that China should help the world get rid of the dollar hegemony sooner rather than later. So let's discuss the weaponization of finance, what it means to be a reserve currency, and to what extent does the United States benefit from reserve currency status. First, let me quickly tell you about today's video sponsor, Morning Brew. As you guys can probably guess, I'm a big consumer of financial news. And Morning Brew is a fantastic way to get up to speed first thing in the morning. Instead of aimlessly browsing social media, sign up for Morning Brew. It's a totally free daily newsletter delivered seven days a week. They get you up to speed on business, finance and tech news in around five minutes each morning. It's become one of my favorite news sources. There's been some great coverage of the effects of these economic sanctions in Morning Brew over the last few weeks. Sign up using the link in the description below. In the aftermath of the 9-11 attacks, the US president quickly passed the Patriot Act, a controversial law that significantly expanded the search and surveillance powers of American federal law enforcement and intelligence agencies. It also gave the Treasury Department the power to cut off financial institutions from the US financial system. The first country to be threatened under this new law was Ukraine, which was accused of allowing Russian criminals to launder money through their banks. Ukraine quickly passed a new law to prevent money laundering. Treasury officials negotiated at the time to gain access to data about suspected terrorists from SWIFT, the Belgium-based messaging system that underpins international financial transactions. This access allowed the United States to cut Al-Qaeda off from all funding. During the Obama administration, the US placed sanctions on Iran's central bank, choking their economy and pressuring them to negotiate the 2015 deal on their nuclear program. At the time, the European governments hated that Americans were telling their banks how to do business, but equally they didn't want to fall foul of the US Treasury. Sanctioning Iran's central bank was a new approach, and it laid the roadmap for last month's sanctions on the Russian central bank. American voters had grown tired over the years of endless wars and taking on the heavily criticized role of global policeman. This new form of warfare didn't involve helicopters, tanks, and body bags being shipped back home. It was the weaponization of the US dollar. Financial shock and awe had become the national security policy of choice. The Global Sanctions Database shows the steady increase in the use of sanctions over the years, from two active sanctions in place in 1950 to over 60 in place today. The effectiveness of financial sanctions derives from the reserve currency status of the US dollar. It's the most widely used currency in the world, and US banks are central to global financial markets. 
it's almost impossible for financial institutions, central banks, and many large companies to operate if they're cut off from the US financial system. Once you include the euro, the British pound, the yen, and the Swiss franc, sanctions become really effective. In a bid to dissuade the Kremlin from invading, the US Senate introduced the Defending Ukraine Sovereignty Act on January 18th. The bill threatened to cut Russia off from access to US dollars as a consequence of their military aggression. The threat didn't work. Western countries are, for obvious reasons, less willing to enter into a military conflict with a nuclear-armed adversary like Russia. And Russia, of course, would have anticipated that financial measures would be the West's primary choice of weapon in a situation like this. Russia has, after all, been facing Western sanctions ever since Putin's 2014 annexation of Crimea. And in response, they devised what's been referred to as the Kalashnikov economy, a reference to the Russian military rifle, a durable primitive system based on low debt, government control of most of the banking system, and a central bank able to intervene and prop up the currency and banks. But the Western sanctions on Russia's central bank were implemented so quickly and with such ferocity that they managed to quickly undercut its ability to support the Russian economy by neutralizing around two-thirds of Russia's financial reserves. There are, of course, costs associated with sanctioning a large economy, and we are seeing those costs show up in inflation figures in the West as supply chains are struggling. No one should really be surprised to see this happening. One of the surprising features of the war in Ukraine is the way that Western countries worked so well together. This was particularly surprising as European leaders have spent decades criticizing the outsized influence of the US currency. The planning around these sanctions began in November as Putin's forces began building up along the Ukrainian border. Putin likely didn't expect such a strong unified reaction as the US and Europe had disagreed about how to respond to the annexation of Crimea eight years earlier. Germany's decision to scrap the Nord Stream 2 pipeline once Russia had invaded Ukraine was crucial in bringing hesitant Europeans along. It was a very important signal to other European countries that sacred cows would have to be sacrificed. A senior State Department official is quoted in the FT as saying, that the horror of Russia's unacceptable, unjustified, and unlawful invasion of Ukraine and the targeting of civilians really unlocked our ability to take further steps. The last-minute nature of the discussions meant that Putin was caught off guard and the Russian central bank didn't have time to move its reserves into other currencies. When Putin launched his invasion of Ukraine in February, Western governments possibly surprised themselves as much as Russia with the strength of their economic response. As a result of the sanctions, the ruble halved in value within two weeks. The effects on Russia were so powerful because of the importance of the dollar and the euro in international trade, financial transactions, and central bank reserves. But by weaponizing central banks in this manner, it could be argued that Western countries risk a backlash that could undermine their long-term importance in the global financial system. Five weeks into the war, the ruble appears to have bounced back, prompting some Russian officials to claim that the economic measures have failed. But of course, this recovery is driven by Russia doubling their interest rates, forcing Russian companies to convert 80% of their revenues into rubles, and imposing capital controls that mean that the Russian people are prohibited from moving their money out of the currency. We have to ask, has a currency actually appreciated if people are only allowed to buy it and are prohibited from selling it? The biggest hole in the sanctions is that Russia can sell all the fossil fuels it likes and use the earnings to support the ruble or import weapons if other countries that haven't signed on to the sanctions are willing to supply them. The idea of sanctioning all energy trade with Russia would be extremely unpalatable to European countries that rely on it for energy meaning that the next step might be to make a credible threat of secondary sanctions against countries or companies outside of Russia found to be supporting it through trade. 
the actual effect that sanctions are having on everyday Russians are difficult to assess right now, as draconian new laws have brought an end to the independent press in Russia, and Western news organizations have removed reporters from the country. The reports that are coming out are that firms that rely on imported goods are in a panic, as these can no longer be purchased. Store shelves are not getting replenished, and unemployment is rising due to Western firms shutting down operations and the extreme supply chain disruptions within the country. The true effect of the sanctions will show up over time. It takes months, not weeks, for sanctions to have their full effect. It should be noted, though, that not all countries by any means are sanctioning Russia. The United States, European Union, United Kingdom, Canada, Japan, Taiwan, Australia and New Zealand have all imposed aggressive sanctions against most of Russia's financial sector and the country's richest and most powerful people. But countries that make up more than half of the world's population are not on side. China, the world's second largest economy, has declined to criticize the invasion, and Indian officials who have been toying with the idea of providing a payments backdoor to Russia say that their government and central bank have looked into the viability of a rupee-ruble arrangement, a mechanism the two countries used during the Soviet era, which also involved barter trades involving oil and other goods. But they stress that the issue is not yet settled in India. As part of its push to reduce dependence on US-controlled systems, China has spent years developing its own cross-border interbank payment system, SIPS, which is quite small compared to SWIFT, but has 1,200 member institutions across 100 countries. This could have important implications for the future of international finance in the long run, as countries around the world respond to seeing Russia's foreign currency reserves being frozen. China claims to have long-term plans for its currency to play a much bigger role in the international financial system, viewing the dollar's dominant position as one of the bulwarks of American power that it wants to chip away at. Globalization, which was historically viewed as a barrier to conflict due to the interdependent nature of global trade, has now become a new battleground. In 1996, columnist Thomas Friedman came up with what was known as the Golden Arches Theory of Conflict Prevention. He put forth that no two countries with a McDonald's franchise had ever gone to war with each other. While this claim was tongue-in-cheek and not actually true at the time, it is worth noting that there are no more McDonald's in Russia today. In China, India, Brazil and the other countries which might potentially help Russia work around these Western sanctions, this outbreak of economic warfare will have them asking themselves if they can still trust the United States and Europe. Many people worry that this war is the beginning of a profound shift in the global economy, away from globalization and away from the dollar's dominance. US government debt has for a long time been international central bankers' preferred place to store reserves, given the size and strength of the US, the safety and tradability of its debt, and the dominant role of the dollar in international trade and finance. Of the $12 trillion worth of foreign currency reserves held by central banks around the world, the dollar accounts for around 59% of that total. The euro is the principal alternative, making up 20% of central bank reserves. After that comes the Japanese yen and the Great British Pound. International holdings of US Treasury bonds were historically seen as a potential source of geopolitical leverage, how do you deal toughly with your banker, Hillary Clinton, the then Secretary of State, asked in 2009. This way of thinking has changed significantly in recent years. Okay, so if the world were to move away from the dollar as a reserve currency, how would this affect the United States, and who would benefit from it? Well, to answer that question, we should return to the French finance minister's argument that the dollar has an exorbitant privilege. A quick look at the way major global economies work will show you that if the United States does have this exorbitant privilege, there are a surprising number of countries going out of their way to avoid sharing any part of it. From China to India to Nigeria and South Africa, 
many countries around the world have capital controls in place. Capital controls, we should note, are as much about preventing foreigners from buying local government bonds as they are about preventing capital from leaving a country. So why do these countries not want foreigners to buy their bonds? The Chinese government talks a lot about wanting to have a global currency that rivals the dollar, but they can't have that if they also want to maintain tight control over their domestic financial system. The economist Michael Pettis points out that the constant trade disputes between the United States and Japan in the 1980s over the undervaluation of the yen can be thought of as disputes about Japan's insistence on its right to give the US more of the exorbitant privilege and the US's refusal to accept Japan's seeming generosity. Trade disputes between China and the US are more of the same. Pettis argues that a world without the US dollar as a reserve currency would likely mean faster growth and less debt for the United States at the expense of slower growth for parts of the rest of the world, especially Asia. When international central banks intervene in their currencies or repress their domestic financial systems with the goal of being more competitive in international trade, they make imported goods more expensive and increase their savings rate by forcing down household consumption. As their savings rise, the excess must be exported, often in the form of central bank purchases of US or European government bonds. If foreign governments intervene in the exchange rate by buying US dollars, they push down the value of their own currency and end up running a current account surplus meaning the value of their exports will be greater than the value of their imports. This difference will be exactly equal to their net dollar purchases. Purchasing excess amounts of US dollars like this is a policy aimed at generating trade surpluses and higher domestic employment. If international central banks are accumulating US dollars to run a current account surplus, that means that the United States has to be running an offsetting current account deficit, which means that as a whole, the country must be buying more goods than they are producing and borrowing money to do so. Foreign purchases of the dollar push up the value of the dollar, making US exports expensive to foreigners and imported goods to the United States cheap. This hurts US manufacturing and would be expected to cause a rise in unemployment in the United States. And the only way to prevent increased unemployment is to increase borrowing either by consumers or the government. Basically, to maintain full employment, the supply of US dollar bonds must rise with the increased foreign demand for US dollar bonds. Global economies keep their reserves in US dollars, euros, yen and pounds for one very simple reason. Only these economies and financial systems are large enough, open enough and flexible enough to accommodate large trade deficits. But the badge of honor associated with being a reserve currency comes at a cost to the nation's economic growth and its ability to manage its debt levels. People who are dismissive of fiat currencies often argue that trade deficits are actually good for an economy, as they involve buying real goods with worthless scraps of paper. But of course, foreigners take these scraps of paper and don't just pile them up. They buy bonds, real estate, stakes in American businesses, American farmland, and so on. This has to happen as a country can only import net foreign savings by exporting ownership of assets. Foreign countries buying assets like this rather than treasury bonds of course does nothing to protect them from sanctions as the assets can still be frozen. Given the huge changes that have taken place in the global economy over the last 40 years, it might at first seem surprising that the Western countries still dominate the financial world. But for the time being, there's no real alternative to holding their currencies. An argument that's often made is that if the United States lost its reserve currency status, this would also mean losing its position on the world economic stage. This argument doesn't hold much water either. The US was the leading economic power in the world by the 1870s and only became the key reserve currency 70 years later. 
London's role as a major global financial center is equally unrelated to the reserve currency status of the British pound, which it lost 80 or so years ago. If you found this piece interesting, you should watch this video next. Don't forget to sign up for Morning Brew using the link in the description below. It's totally free, so there's no reason not to try it out. See you again soon. Bye.